Good morning, everyone. I got a panic text message from my friend Terry on Friday. He said, my car is incapacitated and I'm in Kentucky. I said, what happened? And he showed me a picture and I said, that's not that bad. And he said, but I ran over this thing that looked like a tree root and it ripped part of the wiring harness out. I'm a piano player, so I'm like, so drive it back. He's like, it doesn't work that way. So he said, I know you're going to be there on Sunday because my wife is playing downstairs. He's like, what do you say you just come upstairs and handle service for me? I said, Terry, for you, anything. So we're, so we're going to play, we're going to jam, we're going to sing, and I, maybe we're going to tell the truth and maybe we're going to lie when we say that we just blew the roof off of this place. Um, but that's what I'm going to tell him at 10.03 so he doesn't have to worry about us anymore. But it's nice to be here, and it's always nice to have a microphone in front of a captive audience. <laughs> we can take turns when we're done talking in it. Find me in the river, find me on my knees, I've walked against the water, and now I'm waiting if you please, we've longed to see the roses, but never felt the thorn. Bought our pretty crown, but never paid the price. Find me in the river, find me there. Find me on my knees with my soul laid bare. Even though you're gone and I'm cracked and dry, find me in the river. I'm waiting here. Find me in the river. Find me on my knees. I've walked against the water. I'm waiting if you please. We didn't count on suffering. We didn't count on pain, the blessings in the valley, and the river will wait. Find me in the river, find me there, find me on my knees with my soul laid bare, even though you're gone and I'm cracked and dry. Find me in the river, I'm waiting here. Find me in the river, find me there. Find me on my knees with my soul laid bare. Even though you're gone and I'm cracked and dry, find me in the river. I'm waiting here for you.
Nice job, everyone. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save but thy star. Thou my best friend, waking or sleeping, Thou presence my life. Be Thou my wisdom, be Thou my true word, I ever with Thee and Thou with me were. Be thou my breastplate, my sword of the I need Christ of heaven To me, bright heaven's sun, Christ of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, the ruler of all. Brilliant, Neil. Thank you. Hi, church. Uh, that line in that hymn, um, Riches I Need Not, Nor Man's Empty Praise, has been a line in my own prayer life uh, since I started singing that hymn. I think it's a great way to encapsulate and get you kind of back on track. When I'm worried about things that I probably shouldn't be worried about, a lot of, uh, a lot of what I'm holding can, can be prayed in that line. So I invite you when you find a song that you love like that, find a line that really speaks to you and and just to add it in your prayer life. Um, anyway, that one was mine. A uh, lot going on in the life of the church because it is Holy Week, and we've got a lot of services coming up. Today, we have a funeral service for David Williams. Many of you might know Jean. Um, Jean's sitting at the table where, usually sitting at the table where Jane uh, and Jenny are right now. She has not been able to attend in person for a while because of her husband's health, um, but she's a, a strong supporter of the COP service. And actually, the tree behind you, uh, Janet, is from her. It might show up in an Easter sermon. I haven't decided yet. But that thing, believe it or not, started out from a $1.50 plant that she got at Ikea. <laughs> and the baby of that mama plant is in her, her home and is, is about as big and healthy. So... Uh, Jean has a wonderful green thumb, and we celebrate the life of her husband today at 2. Uh, there are two Sundays left to sign up for the Easter Giving Tree. If you haven't done so already, it's in the Welcome Center as you leave today. Uh, they're collecting used, gently used and new household items for Jewish family services as those uh, refugees resettle in the area. So you can bring those items back to church uh, throughout the week, but also on Easter Sunday. And Holy Week schedule is... Is, as it has been in years past, we'll have a Monday-Thursday service here. But new this year, we're going to have a community fellowship time. There'll be uh, refreshments and some light food 
and we're going to be joined together with two other congregations, uh, the leadership and membership of Shalom, and did I say that right? Is it Shalom Community Church? And then uh, Bethlehem. And so we'll see some new faces around for the Monday Thursday service. And on Good Friday, we're going to head down uh, State Street to First Baptist Church, and we'll hold an an hour-long Good Friday service there with the clergy of First Methodist, First United Methodist, and First Baptist. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to take these churches that are just a few blocks from each other at a really busy week and, and share these holy times together. Uh, finally, the COP service is up here on Saturday at 4.09. Does anybody remember why we had it at 4.09? basketball was clearly not this year but uh, in other years <laughs> Michigan was in the final four and our and the game was at 609 and the service was supposed to be at six so we changed it back to 409 to be cute and funny and now you know eight years later it's still at 409 <laughs> yeah but that'll continue at 409 Saturday and then we'll have one community worship service at 10 on Easter Sunday so I think that's it for announcements let's enter into a time of prayer and let's uh, begin in a moment of silence Lord, today we begin the final push of our Lenten journey, the road to Jerusalem. We join the ancestors who first lined this road and waved palms in triumphal hope, saying, Hosanna, blessed is our King, the Son of David. We today come to worship high on hope, not in the sorrow of what we know is to come. Even though we have seen it and know what is down the road. Today is about how distress and turmoil can be transformed into hope and peace. And today we have hope. We hold on to hope, Lord, for the times we are immobilized by anger or fear or sadness. We hold on to hope, Lord, not only for us, but for our nation and our world. We hold hope for those who are living in turmoil and fear, those living in war zones, those starving to death in Gaza or struggling to find basic supplies in Cuba. We remember the words Clemens wrote, that night in darkness and fog enfold a confused wor world. Yet we also remember the words of St. Gregory, that behold, already night and shadows taper off. God, both can be true, and we pray that we can hold on to hope that the light and dawn will sparkle and quiver once again. Thank you, God, for your ability to do the impossible, to make stones sing Hosanna, to rain manna from heaven, to draw water from a rock, to soften the hardest of hearts. May we cling to the stories where with you anything is possible, especially with that superpower of hope that was founded in you. As we enter into the holiest of weeks, O oh Lord, we bring to you our everyday stresses and our larger-than-life worries. We bring our pesky doubts and the worries of global proportion. We bring our stubborn hope and our cries of humble gratitude for all the ways that you have blessed us and continue to bless us. We bring all that we have. We bring all that we hope to become. As we end our prayer time today, we pray in the words of this brilliant composer that we'll hear at 10 a.m. She writes, illuminate those in darkness and in the shadow of death sit. Lord, may you direct our feet in the way of peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. There once was a holy fool by the name of uh, Nasruddin in the 12th century, and he was reported to, um, he was going to go give a sermon he didn't want to give, and so the first time he showed up and said, okay, do you know what I'm going to say? And they said, no, we don't. He says, well, if people don't know what I'm going to be even be talking about, I'm not going to preach here, and he walks away. And he Comes back the next time they invite him, and, and, they, um, and he tries the same thing. He says, do you, do you know what I'm going to say? But this time they were like, aha, we're going to say, yes, uh, yes, we do. He says, good, then you don't need to hear it. 
and then he, then he walks away. The next time, they're like, okay, this time, everybody, half of people say yes, half of you say no. So he comes back, and he says, okay, um, do you know what I'm going to preach about? And half of them say yes, and half of them say no. And he's like, well, good. Those of you who know can tell it to the other half and goes away. Naz Rudin was a funny guy, um, and I was... Uh, I'm neither as holy nor as foolish. And so um, our topic today of Palm Sunday is something we get to suffer through together. Now, to suffer is an interesting word because it's at the heart of Holy Week, the passion of Christ. Passio comes from to suffer. And a lot of this Holy Week is walking the footsteps of Jesus through that final week of his life in both the suffering, um, but there's also this wider context. And Marcus Borg, who um, some of you have been reading the book of the last week, I'll make a few references to it here, um, references that the passion, you know, in pop culture, you know, what are you passionate about? It's like, what, what draws your heart? What makes you feel more alive? And that sense of passion is also alive this week because certainly it's that sense of aliveness and call in the world that led Jesus and so many others into lives that are also put at risk. When you're called so strongly to something, you're you're willing to do anything. And so may we engage this part of that Holy Week. I sometimes imagine that first entry back into Jerusalem for Jesus in entering this last week. It was a time of Passover. Um, There was a lot going on. And I wonder what it would have felt like for him to be coming into town. In general, he wasn't a city guy. Most of the time, he'd hang out in the villages, go near cities around them, but not always into the cities. And this time getting ready to go into the city, I imagine it like about going on a roller coaster. Anybody here like roller coasters? You know, see, a lot of yeses and a lot of noes, noes. There's this moment when you get on the ride, before it even really starts, where it, you, you're in the car and you just start going up, 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 just very slowly, it seems, and everything gets a little more distant, a little more surreal, and you're realizing things are about to get real. It's that moment before it even drops where you're like, something is different, get ready for it. And I feel those sense of uh, butterflies in the stomach as maybe something that Jesus might have been encountering as well, getting ready to go in there. You know, there's so many ways in which human nature is flawed and disappointing. And that's something that Jesus was aware of at that time, too. Um, He'd already had people betray him. He wasn't uh, under any special illusions of what that week was going to be like for him. Although so much of my image has been one of Jesus walking into this week fairly naive. Being a good person, people expecting a lot of him, And the process of elevating someone and then cutting them down is one of the cruelest and most common things people do to each other. Expecting too much and then punishing them when they they weren't how you wanted them to be. Like the difference between the idea of someone and the reality of someone is sometimes very far away. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a comical love song, actually, about um, how, how ideal a person's partner is, and then singing this love song to this ideal, idealized version of them, where it's like, you know, the idea of you is perfect, but the real you sucks. <laughs> and it's just the idea of that sense of disappointment, but what, how do you hold that, and how do we see with open eyes and not want things to be different than they are, but still live into a world that we want to change and be part of that change along the way. And so 
Jesus was part of that change. He was a change agent, and he was um, walking into Jerusalem, uh, well, not himself, but on the, the back of a, remember? Here, we can read the, let's read the text. Um, the versions are, are, are not too different between the different Gospels. Um, and today, I'll, I'll read from the Gospel of John. We see in chapter 12, verses 12 through 19, the next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Here ends the reading. One of the many things that are interesting about this is um, a small piece in the Greek that I didn't know until um, this last week, and that is um, the word that John uses for the donkey is uh, onos polos. And so polos is uh, pi omicron, uh, lambda omicron sigma, uh, or P-O-L-O-S, versus, which is, sounds a little bit like polis, which is the word for city, which is very similar in the word except with an omicron instead of an omicron. Oh, sorry, omicron instead of an omega. And this is about to get political in more than one way. I sometimes wonder when we talk so much about politics, whether it really comes from workings of the city or of the donkey. We don't know. And yet one thing that um, Borg and Crossan point out and highlight in this book the last week um, is how we usually think of just this one entrance into Jerusalem that day. But the reality is that there were two grand entrances into Jerusalem that day. There's the one where Jesus comes in on the donkey, but on the same day, it had been going on for years, there was the grand Roman entrance into the city. There were the cavalry entering, there were the foot soldiers, uh, there was the Roman governors coming in as a grand show of power because what holiday were they gathering for the festival of? Passover. And, and what, what, do, what was the Jewish tradition about the Passover meal and what they were celebrating? Freedom from the Egyptians. Yeah. So a great festival held every year that celebrates their liberation. Now, if you were an oppressive empire, would you want them to just uh, feel empowered to be liberated? At You know, not that so much. So they would come into town, especially for this, in a grand processional, a great show of power, to say, listen, we support you having some level of autonomy as long as you pay tribute and don't question our authority. It was a big act of empire. And so here in the middle of Jerusalem, you see this great entrance of, um, of authority and empire coming in from the west, um, and then on the east, 
somebody coming in on a donkey. You know, it changes the image a little bit. It, this, was, this was a planned, intentional act of peace activism. Does that change anything for you? I know it does for me, too, in thinking even of the intentionality of Jesus, too, whether it was, oh, we'll just see what happens, to being like, no, we're going to rile things up. Like, let's, like, what are we called to do in this system? When people are being uh, oppressed, what is our role in that? There's sometimes a practice in um, Lectio Divina, which is a way of reading scripture, where there's different parts to it. Sometimes it's reading it more than once and letting it echo um, sort of with your heart and, and soul to just see what resonates in, and not. But another piece of it is sometimes imagining yourself in the story of which character would you be. Because in this scenario, you have the Roman authorities coming in, you have Jesus, you have the crowd cheering Jesus on. Now, the crowd itself is ambiguous. It's like saying, like, oh, I read on the internet somewhere. You know, there's more than one crowd. And so the people who were cheering Jesus in his entrance on the east might have been different people who were calling for his crucifixion at other times. That's something easy to conflate, especially when we hear, the crowd wanted this, the crowd wanted that, but... I read in a chat group this or a chat group that, you know, they're not always the same people. But who would we be in that? And then, there, and then there's the layer of the church authorities and the priestly families, too, who are truly caught in the middle. I would not envy any of those uh, positions or people who are at risk from and often hated on both sides in terms of the... Um, people feeling like they're collaborating with the, author with the oppressive forces and the authorities, and yet on the authorities, they're saying like, well, we need our tribute, and you need to keep everyone in line, and if you don't, we, you know, it's easy for you to disappear, um, and it's easy for your people to suffer more if you don't collaborate, and that is an unenviable uh, catch-22. Speaking of Catch-22, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, anybody ever read any of his stuff? He liked to identify himself as a Christ-worshipping agnostic. And he, he wrote a book called Palm Sunday, uh, which has very little to do with Palm Sunday except for the closing sermon. He didn't give a lot of sermons, but the one he did was um, on Palm Sunday. And he talked about, especially the night before Palm Sunday and going into that and what it would have been like for Jesus to see this coming and to have a moment um, where, you know, he's hanging out with some of his dearest friends and Judas is coming over saying like, are you really going to let her touch your hair like that? That's not very holy. What, what about the money? And he's like, are you really going to play holier thou, holier than thou at this time with me? He's like, doesn't feel right. For Kurt Vonnegut, it comes down to being kind in the world, that the message he saw in Jesus was about bringing kindness and peace that way. But the picture that we see painted by uh, Borg and Cross in here as a peace activist, yes, but someone willing to shake things up, that there's got to be some backbone to that. There's got to be some resolve, a willingness to, um, to speak truth to power and to live into a world that is full of chaos and not just to avoid things that are hard. My invitation for all of us um, this morning is to continue imagining what things might be like or might have been like um, during that Holy Week, because sometimes we inherit specific images of what that experience would have been like or who Jesus was, but that we stay open to see um, if different facts and experiences change that 
And so does the idea of Jesus sitting around planning something with his, um, with his comrades um, and the peace demonstration that's happening at the same time that there was this great show of power on the other side. Does that change things? And then secondly, where would you see yourself in the story? Would you be part of a, a church institution? Would you be part of uh, the peace protest itself? What are the other options? Sometimes I feel like the donkey. I'm just like, oh, what do I, I was just standing here minding my own business, and now I'm roped into something else that I don't really understand. But um, there's so many different ways to see ourselves in the stories, and I invite us to do that this holy week as well. So may the God that continues to be in our world today continue to guide our hearts and minds in the days to come. Amen. Wondrous Cross. Uh, this next tune is for me to play and you to listen to. And I was rifling through my stack of music, which is in here. Um, there are a few thousand tunes, but it's fun to look through what I have because I just collect a bunch of stuff from a lot of different places and a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. And sometimes I come across stuff and I don't remember where it came from or why I did it uh, in the first place. Um, this one's purely instrumental, and I think um, I liked the, the version I heard because it was piano-centric. A lot of times you hear things, and it might be based off of guitar, or maybe it's a, a, a string group or a, a larger ensemble, and, and that drew me in. Um, I'm going to play through the whole thing, but I'll, I'll let you know what the words to the chorus are. Um, and especially this week, Holy Week, um, and the meaning behind all of it. And I think we can find a little bit of meaning in the words to the songs that we sing, but also um, little bits and pieces of things that apply to the rest of our, our lives too. So I ran into this thing and I found it. I was like, this is money. Somebody's helping me out here right now. Um, uh, and the chorus, uh, the words to the chorus are, are, are this. Oh, the wondrous cross where the prince of glory died. Oh, the glorious cross where your mercy bled for us. You overcame the grave, waking to a world you saved. Oh, the wondrous cross.
one you all know. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, fly away when the shadows of this life have grown I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars have flown I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away when I die hallelujah by and by Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. die hallelujah by and by fly away My friends, may we grow in grace, the love of our Lord and Savior. My friends, may we grow in grace, and the love of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory now and forever, now and forever, amen. To God be the glory now and forever, now and forever. Thank you all so much. Have a fabulous holy week. And I'll see you at 409 next Saturday with five or six or seven other fabulous people. And uh, if you want to meet my dad, um, come next week because he'll be here. <laughs>